today is about plasma nanotechnology and uh, for science uh, that emerges from applications of plasma in nanoscale science and technology and uh, nanoplasmas. So my talk is structured in this way. First, I will discuss the uh, scope, focus and aims of uh, this research area, discuss some very fundamental features of uh, uh, plasma related processes at nanoscales, and uh, then consider applications of plasmas in catalysis. First, in the preparation of uh, catalytic materials, and second, uh, consider synergistic reactions between the plasma and catalysts in important applications. Then I will expand my discussion into the uh, sustainability area and will consider how plasma nanotechnology can be applied in various applications that are important for the sustainable future of humankind and for achieving zero carbon society. Then I will conclude my presentation with a brief outlook of the extreme and unique state of matter, which is nanoplasma, which appears when we try to reduce the size of the plasma to nanoscale domain. What is plasma? Plasma is well known as the fourth state of matter. In addition to solid, liquid, and gas, it forms a unique state of matter. It's characterized by the uh, ionized phase, by the presence of electrons and ions, and as such, plasma appears to respond very fast to external excitations, such as electromagnetic excitations, and it also could be used to interact with very small objects because the uh, sizes of ions and electrons are intrinsically very small. And uh, that underpins many important applications of plasmas in processing of materials. And plasma nanoscience is one particular area that focuses on the processing of uh, nanoscale materials, we call nanomaterials, using plasmas, in particular low temperature plasmas. And the plasma nanoscience has two fundamental questions. One fundamental question is that what happens when low temperature plasma contacts objects that have nanometer structure or dimensions? And the second fundamental question that plasma nanoscience studies is what happens if we will reduce the size of the plasma to micrometer and then further on to nanometer domain? Can we ensure that such a plasma exists? And what conditions do we need to meet to create such a plasma? Everything step by step. It took many years to develop this research field from the beginning, from the basic concepts of plasma as a versatile nanofabrication tool to further insights on how plasma interacts with various objects at different time scales, starting from the sizes of uh, typical plasma reactors, which are of the order of uh, a meter size or tens of centimeters typically, down to the sizes of very small nanostructures such as a carbon nanotubes or even smaller particles that have dimensions in the nanometer scale and have some specific features which are even smaller than nanometers and with individual atoms that are less than one nanometer in size. All these interactions, they have a very unique signatures of their unique plasma phase. So when plasma interacts with uh, uh, objects of uh, different sizes, uh, it brings unique uh, physics and chemistry into these interactions and uh, creates many fundamental synergies when uh, we try to understand and harness the benefits from these fundamental interactions, from interactions of plasma with uh, uh, particles to atomic bonds and even individual atoms and also electrons and ions. With time, the synergies of our plasma have emerged into other important areas, such as 
catalysis, manufacture, materials production, as well as sustainability. And in particular, the technologies that produce important materials, chemicals, fuels, food, and other important things for our economy and for our life. Of, st of, of special interest is the fundamental area that is related to uh, plasmas of uh, very high densities with uh, extreme energy densities and uh, very small dimensions, which we call nanoplasma, as I already mentioned. What are we trying to achieve? We are trying to consider the interactions of plasmas with nanoscale objects, such as uh, these carbon nanotubes and catalytic particles from which the nanotubes emerge, to create them using less material, less energy, make the processes more efficient, faster, greener, and more sustainable, and yet achieve better quality of uh, these uh, uh, structures and materials and uh, achieve that uh, at lower cost, leading also to better performance in practical applications. And when we do uh, plasma processing and target new structures, new materials produced using plasma, we are looking at the new effects generated by the plasma and ions, new functionalities, faster processing, and also creating some effects that are even not possible to achieve using some other methods such as chemistry or wet processing or thermal processes. So let's consider next section, fundamental features and processes. They are basically summarized on this uh, uh, sketch of uh, the plasma that interacts with a solid surface. And plasma is separated from the solid surface by the uh, non-electrically neutral area called plasma sheath, through which the species created in the plasma. They travel towards the surface, such as plasma ions, radicals, excited species. And uh, once they reach the surface, they form nanoscale objects, such as nanoparticles, as you can see here. And uh, they also migrate all over the surface to facilitate the growth of functionalization of uh, those particles. When such interactions takes play, take place, they essentially hurl the nanoscale control of energy and matter, the exchange of energy and matter between the plasma phase and the grain particle, which happens over very small scales, such as the size of this particle, which, as I said, is of the order of nanometers. One great example is the carbon nanotube, where you can see on the surface of such a small object, myriads of various reactions may take place. And not only on the surface of the nanotube, but also on the surface of the small catalyst particle from which the carbon nanotube actually grows. Plasma interactions with uh, uh, carbon nanotubes and the catalyst particles, they start from the very uh, initial point when the, these uh, here uh, nickel atoms, they accept some carbon atoms and some initial carbon uh, hexagonal sp2 carbon networks, they form on, on the surface of these particles and then they shape up and then they extend and form carbon nanotubes. Very important thing is that uh, the uh, energy of the ions that are generated by the plasma and uh, are delivered to the surface of uh, the, this catalyst particle, they have to be adjusted in a proper way so that uh, uh, they uh, uh, not only cause the nucleation of the carbon nanotube, like the first uh, band graphene layer, but also do not cause damage to them. And uh, this uh, common perception that uh, plasma exposure, uh, uh, plasma interaction with uh, fragile graphene networks uh, necessarily should uh, induce some damage is not always true. And uh, this works proves that if the energy of ions is in the range from 5 to 25 electron volts, then uh, not only the uh, uh, 
developing tribal network is not damaged, but it also is restructured. Re hexagonal rings are formed, and the defects are here. From that small graphene cluster, the carbon nanotubes, they form. They form in a way that the, the cluster, uh, the first layer of graphene, they bend, and then they are extended and form carbon nanotubes. The very interesting point is that when the carbon nanotubes, they grow in plasma, the growth becomes possible at temperatures that are significantly lower than in normal thermal chemical deposition processes. Very often, by the order of a couple of hundred and sometimes even more degrees lower than using other typically thermal processes. And this highlighted example from one of our earlier works, we can see that uh, uh, a selected single wall carbon nanotube with age uh, 6 chirality, it nucleates in a plasma at almost 200 degrees temperature lower than in the normal thermal CVD. And uh, this owes to the increased bending energy of the uh, graphene initial layer that uh, bends and extends, also assisted by the electric field of the plasma to form the established carbon nanotube. There are many other fundamental processes that underpin the in unique interactions of plasma with uh, nanoscale objects. And uh, they lead to the formation of various structures, just as exemplify, exemplified on this uh, uh, slide, just uh, uh, single layer, bilayer, trilayer graphenes, and uh, which not only can grow in the uh, uh, parallel to the surface orientation as flat layers, uh, uh, basically laying on the surface horizontally, or the graphene-like structures that emerge perpendicular with respect to the supporting catalytic surface, in this case, copper, that they grow vertically and form a network of those vertical structures. We call them vertically oriented graphenes. They are very interesting fundamentally and are utilized in many applications. One very interesting uh, effect, fundamental effect of interactions of plasma with both the catalytic surface on which the nanostructures grow and the nanostructures themselves is the unique uh, uh, changes in uh, hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity when uh, uh, it becomes possible to actually separate the growth layers of uh, these vertically oriented graphenes from the copper, from the copper foil on which we grow them using plasma. And uh, this unique process actually uh, has created a very interesting opportunities, not only to produce the uh, graphene structures at uh, much lower temperatures, which could be as low as 250 degrees versus typical temperature of the order of uh, many hundreds of degrees and up to 1,000 degree characteristic to thermal chemical vapor deposition. Um, faster processes and better control, and as already showed, the separation of the ground structures from the catalyst using water without any chemicals, and in very interesting thing, the ability to reuse the catalyst and grow uh, those nanostructures using plasma on the catalyst again and again. And uh, energy cost-wise, it's very important that uh, the cost of the plasma process, because it's faster and it's efficient, uh, it can become as low as just 3% of a comparable thermal processes that produce similar types of nanostructures. If we extract ions from the plasma, which is very common in ion sources and also in uh, uh, materials uh, characterization analytical devices, such as helium ion microscope. Uh, when they extract the ions, then their control of energy of those ions, as I said, was very important. But another very important factor that is needed to be controlled during the interaction of uh, ions with matter is the ion flux. So when the ion flux uh, is controlled from uh, when the helium plus ions extracted and irradiated porous, porous silica, uh, uh, por sorry, uh, porous alumina, alum, alum, alumina uh, templates, the effect of uh, uh, flux 
of uh, helium ions ejected by the helium ion microscope turned out to be very, very important. And uh, the pores that are intrinsic to this porous material, they uh, uh, become shrinking, shrinking. And uh, as you can see, that this is the normal size of the pores, and this is the smaller size of the pore that could be reduced from typical, uh, which is of the order of uh, 100 nanometers and to just uh, 10 nanometers or even below. This type of uh, uh, material swelling and uh, uh, shrinking the pores could actually be utilized as a very fundamental process of uh, writing nanoscale features on the surface using these uh, targeted and uh, well-focused ion beams where the logo of our university was successfully written and also published in this Nature Communications paper in 2018. So next point is how to apply these unique features of plasma processing in the formation of uh, advanced functional nanomaterials and apply them in catalysis. This was uh, the topic of our uh, fundamental article, which we published in Chemical Reviews, which highlighted the uh, fundamentals of a uh, plasma catalysis. When plasma interacts with nanoscale features of catalysts of solid particles to reform various gases, other precursors, and produce useful chemicals and fuels. When interacting with uh, solid surfaces, plasmas, they uh, show synergistic effects at the nanoscale, which we have uh, explained and discussed in great detail in this paper. When coming to the processing of uh, catalytic nanoparticles, one particular thing that plasma can do is uh, to address the current emerging needs of science and technology of renewable energy that is highlighted by the many roadmaps of European science and technology agency, of American Department of Energy, all similar age research agencies, companies uh, worldwide highlight the need of uh, forming materials that uh, can respond to the uh, emerging and rapidly uh, uh, developing needs of uh, the next generation, energy efficient, catalytic technology of the future. So that uh, particularly the catalyst that could perform better than natural en enzymes that could be stable, durable, very active, could be generated from natural materials, ideally from waste, using less amount of energy, and uh, then would be controllable, not only at the atomic scale, but also at electronic scale during the interaction, and uh, where uh, the uh, systems uh, for their production of energy, chemicals, and other utilities could be uh, developed uh, to be deployable, distributed, and uh, not only be operated at a large scale of uh, industrial plants, but also as distributed systems that could be operated remotely and even by individual uh, farmers, individual workers, and uh, off the grid using renewable energy in particular. So to address these facts, we develop plasma systems, plasma processes that uh, can enable such uh, features, such high performing catalysts and uh, energy efficient and effective processes. Let us start from high performance catalyst that is targeted for one of the most in demand processes of uh, water electrocatalytic water splitting using water electrolysis, for which catalysts are needed uh, to sustain both half reactions of production of uh, hydrogen on the cathode and oxygen on the anode. And we particularly address the production of uh, the catalyst for the oxygen evolution reaction on the anode, which the reaction, which uh, is widely considered as one of the most difficult and challenging. So we use this atmospheric pressure plasma reactor and process the, the material, which is called the Prussian blue analog, which contained iron atoms and also incorporated cobalt atoms. And uh, the iron, iron, and uh, iron and cobalt atoms, they were connected in their three-dimensional atomic network, and plasma was used to process that three-dimensional network. 
While processing the, processing that, that uh, atomic network, the processing turned out to be gentle and very effective. As you can see, even after two hours of gentle plasma treatment, the PBA crystals, they did not even uh, change shape or structure. So basically the crystalline structure of uh, the crystals was not even affected. But the catalyst uh, started behaving much better than before the plasma treatment. As we can see that the over potential of the oxygen evolution reaction was significantly reduced and that the kinetics of the reaction was enhanced by uh, and exemplified by the lower tuffle slopes achievable and also by the high stability of the catalyst that was able to operate over many hours, even at the relatively high energy densities of 100 milliamps per square centimeter. The mechanism that we revealed within, behind this transformation is related to the interaction of plasma generated oxygen species that are generated directly in air when they interact with the PBA network and uh, the uh, cyanide bridge connecting cobalt and iron atoms. So when uh, this uh, bridge is ionized, so that the, uh, the uh, bond is broken and atoms rearrange. So it affects the oxidation states of both metal atoms and it uh, forms a peroxide uh, bridge and uh, it affects the performance of this catalyst in oxygen evolution reaction. And as it turned out, very positively. The interaction of oxygen species with various nanoscale objects has also been reported by other authors, such as unzipping of carbon nanotubes, uh, when uh, oxygen plasma interacting with carbon nanotubes uh, led uh, to the formation of highly controllable graphene nanoribbons. This interaction is unique to the plasma and uh, only is effective only after very specific conditions that are found after rigorous plasma-specific research. Next is highlighting the synergy of interaction between their catalysts and the plasma when they are used together. So when they are used together in catalysis, many several many interesting effects appear, such as uh, the uh, changes in the prevailing chemical reaction, changing in the oxidation uh, states of the catalyst and performance of the catalyst, but also uh, lower activation barriers for the reaction, lower temperatures, and uh, several other interesting effects that appear only when both Catalyst and plasma are used, for example, in some gas reforming. One such example of gas reforming is highlighted here in this slide. You know that uh, we uh, need to convert natural gas that is abundant and uh, produce fuels, some chemicals, and hydrogen fuel. And one effective way to do that is to use plasma catalytic reactions that are based on so-called dielectric barrier discharges that are generated in the tubes that are equipped with the two electrodes. One is in the middle of the tube and the other one is on the outside of the tube. The tube is packed with uh, the uh, glass typically or other dielectric material beads that are small, typically micrometer-sized particles that fully fill up the space. And then the space between those little particles is then filled by the gas that we are going to reform. And then plasma is excited in those small spaces after we apply some voltage. And the voltage could be applied in very different ways. And in this particular example, the voltage is applied in a very energy efficient way using nanosecond plasma excitation, nanosecond pulses that deliver high amount of energy, but intermittently and save energy otherwise when you do not need to supply. What happens when you supply this energy and then switch it off? What happens is that the catalytic beads 
they interact with the plasma and the electric charge is distributed on them and they facilitate the generation of electric gas discharges in those small spaces, typically sub-millimeter and even micrometer spaces between those catalytic beads. Plasma is generated and the density of plasma increases with time. And as the plasma density increases with time, it becomes more effective in interaction with uh, the gas that we are trying to reform and are generating the uh, products of the reaction. If you see the uh, temporal dynamics of those processes that last, uh, you see that over nanoseconds and continue between the pulses also, the uh, more we see uh, uh, look into the uh, interspaces between those uh, the catalytic beads, we see more uh, CO and uh, hydrogen are generated with time. So that uh, the uh, uh, number density of uh, the products, they can be controlled by the uh, plasma parameters, by the catalyst parameters. And uh, as a result, one can tune what we produce as a result of these uh, catalytic reactions, such as we put in into the reactor, essentially the uh, 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 two molecules, carbon dioxide and methane, the natural ingredients of natural gas. And then as the main products, we generate CO and hydrogen. And then we target uh, this, the production of uh, these uh, uh, important uh, uh, molecules and uh, to minimize the unwanted byproducts and uh, control the mechanisms of those reactions and interactions between the plasma and catalyst and also intermediaries, which form the basis of plasma catalysis. Let us discuss now how we can use these basics and uh, these applied features to uh, apply the plasma in sustainable nanotechnology. And uh, there are several means to apply and uh, treat for example, sustainable resources, treat waste, agricultural waste, plastics, carbon dioxide, but also treat uh, biomass, uh, some products uh, like bio oils, ethanol, and also uh, treat microorganisms and stimulate, uh, like for example, production of uh, sugars or some chemicals, and also treat water. Treat water, treat other uh, chemicals, petrochemicals, uh, and many other possible things that we can process. Very important thing is to use renewable energy in this treatment. And one of the most uh, exciting ways is to use what we can even say solar plasma. But it's not plasma in the sun, which has millions of degrees temperature, but it is our low temperature plasma that we generate using solar panels. Capture solar light and use uh, voltage converters to generate uh, high power uh, and uh, high pressure, at atmospheric pressure, plasma discharges, such as spark discharges, uh, in uh, the air or even in solutions where can, we can put a lot of uh, precursors, as I will show you in several examples, and uh, we can produce solid liquid materials and then apply them. For example, use them, the solid materials uh, with the specifically customized pores in energy storage materials, such as supercapacitors. So a lot more examples will follow. Let's consider first, is uh, like a treatment in the uh, dry, in the gas phase. The same discharge, which I showed you before, was used to treat biochar, a common byproduct of uh, agricultural, industrial activity. And uh, just by simple treatment by plasma at atmospheric pressure, biochar becomes more active and uh, more active in two very important applications for sustainability, for storage of renewable energy in supercapacitors, and also by absorbing some harmful contaminants from the water. Another uh, area of application, as I said, this was the uh, dry processing. 
And now we can process liquids using plasma. When we process liquids using plasma, we substantially and fundamentally modify the chemistry of the liquids. Essentially, we electrify the liquids by injecting electrons and ions into the liquid. And uh, we make it more electrically conductive. We make them a lot more uh, reactive, increase the oxidative ability, capacity of uh, these plasma activated solutions. And also in the most common example, when uh, uh, water is treated just under atmospheric conditions in open air, then the pH value of the water can be substantially reduced to make it uh, uh, quite active acid if pH of the order of three, and in many cases, even lower than that. So let's see what examples we can have when we treat various solutions that uh, if we can put, uh, for example, lignin, a common product of biomass decomposition into the water, into some solvent, we can uh, run the power to chemicals process and uh, using plasma activation of this uh, solution and generate a number of uh, useful chemicals. And uh, this uh, processing varies depending on which solvents we use. And also if we use any additional catalytic particles that also interact with the plasma discharges that we generate either in contact with the liquid or inside the liquids. One example of uh, plasma discharges that are on inside the liquid is when we insert two electrodes and generate electric spark in uh, uh, like ethanol solution uh, where we can uh, uh, have uh, a carbon precursor and uh, this electric spark lead to very interesting process that lead simultaneously to the production of uh, gaseous hydrogen, which is collected as, is, as a gas product, and also to solid objects that are called carbon quantum dots, and in particular with graphene-like structure. So we also call them graphene quantum dots. That has led to the new process, which we call carbon to carbon, hydrogen to hydrogen, and the high uh, energy uh, excitation by the plasma is a massive accelerator to that process, which makes it fast and also energy efficient and is characterized by low energy consumption for the hydrogen production. So of course, this still requires further improvements and development. And uh, several groups are actively working on various aspects of production of hydrogen, carbon materials from this type and similar types of solution. Now, as I mentioned, we can treat water. First, we can, of course, can improve the membranes for water treatments. And uh, the earlier mentioned uh, modification of carbon nanotubes turns out to be extremely useful in this regard. So when uh, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, they're exposed to the plasma and only the outer wall of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes is intentionally modified by the plasma. And when those carbon nanotubes, they add up on the surface of a conventional uh, microporous membrane for water purification, then the, the nanotubes, they also become as adsorptive uh, materials that capture salt from the solution. And amazingly, they can capture four times the own weight, so that the weight of the salt, of sodium chloride salt from uh, uh, water that we are trying to desalinate it's four times higher than the weight of, of the carbon nanotubes. So that is a very effective uh, uh, treatment by the plasma uh, for water desalination and for the production of uh, desalination membranes. And a more recent example shows that we can also treat water directly. And not treat, while treating seawater directly, we can not only evaporate it, and separate salt crystals from the evaporated water. Then the evaporated water becomes plasma activated. Plasma activated desalinated water. 
And in those uh, plasma activated desalinated water, we have uh, reactive species, as I discussed above. And those reactive species, they uh, facilitate the electrocatalytic processes, in particular uh, for water splitting reaction. If you use plasma activated desalinated water as electrolyte, and also uh, if we utilize that uh, for uh, for germination and growth of plants, it accelerates the uh, germination and plant growth processes. On top of that, we can extract uh, nanomaterials from the soil that we separate from seawater and utilize them for further nanomaterial synthesis. Those nanomaterials, they contain manganese oxide and manganese oxide is well known as a very useful particle for further carbon capture. So in that way, when we treat seawater directly by the plasma, we then extract useful particles uh, that later are used to directly decarbonize, to directly decarbonize and capture carbon dioxide. To do this, we mix biomass, and uh, the uh, extracts from you know, sea salt, uh, and uh, uh, we do material recovery and synthesis of uh, hybrid material that contains uh, carbon and uh, ma magnesium oxide uh, particles. And uh, it substantially increases the uh, capacity uh, for carbon dioxide capture uh, compared to the uh, carbon support or uh, separately taken uh, magnesium oxide particles. And in that way, we can say that they act synergistically in carbon dioxide capture. Further example, further example, if we further produce these carbon particles that can later be used to test the water against the contaminants. And that one viable way to do that is to customize the optical emission that is generated by the plasma produced carbon quantum dots so that they would be able to emit light in a certain range. For example, in here, we produce carbon particles using plasma directly discharged on the water containing some carbon precursors so that some particles, they are able to produce blue light, some are able to produce green light. But we also produce some particles that are bifunctional, that can be excited in two frequency ranges, in blue and green. And in that way, they can change color. They can change color. And the very interesting is that when we applied those particles for testing uh, copper uh, two plus contaminant in water, then depending on the uh, uh, concentration of this contaminant, then the uh, Carbon dots, they displayed different color of optical emission so that uh, you can see along all these tubes, different concentration of uh, Cu2 plus. So that as the concentration increases, the color also changes from green to blue. And uh, this is another application, how plasma processing can be used to produce uh, active functional nanomaterials for uh, detection of uh, uh, contaminants in seawater. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, co our concept and the approach how this uh, plasma treatment could be scaled up to manufacturing and uh, using renewable energy, plasmas operated at atmospheric pressure and roll-to-roll -roll processes. Then uh, you can put uh, some precursors on uh, the uh, roll and then pass them for the plasma and uh, develop the processes that would lead to the formation of uh, functional materials, catalysts, or modify the materials that we already put on this conveyor belt for scaling up and processing. This is an exciting opportunity for future research and development. Now, the last section of our talk uh, today is nanoplasma as unique extreme stage of the matter. If we look at the, the possibilities of uh, creating various states of matter under different conditions, under extreme conditions when the density of matter could be increased substantially, and also sometimes the temperatures also simultaneously increased, one can create a, a very unique and extreme states of the matter. This particularly applies to the plasma if we are aiming to reduce 
this force are in a nice state of meta uh, to nanoscales so that we have to both increase the uh, density of the plasma and uh, have a, uh, a high uh, energy conditions. So those conditions are very unique and they were analyzed in this relatively recent uh, uh, paper in reviews of modern physics. Where is the ultimate energy uh, extremes to generate such nanoplasmas? Which objects can be uh, used to produce uh, like a combination of uh, uh, here ions and electrons that uh, this uh, uh, cluster of electrons and ions would still be somehow in the uh, nanoscale range and uh, how to uh, ensure that uh, what we generated is still a plasma, not just uh, some excited state of matter or something else. And uh, all those conditions, they were examined very carefully in this paper and uh, uh, also uh, uh, highlighted some means of generating of uh, such nanoplasmas. When, for example, uh, very high uh, density uh, and ultra short laser pulses in typically in femtosecond range are irradiated on array of nanowires or some nanoparticles when those nanoscale objects, they literally explode. And while they explode, then the uh, electrons are ejected and uh, the ions follow and uh, such uh, uh, like oscillating electron ions clouds uh, are formed and uh, that creates uh, those unique localized uh, very high density nanoplasmas which can also can have uh, uh, the uh, uh, energies generated even in the relativistic domain and uh, they also develop and uh, evolve with time. And uh, what is really interesting is, remember, at the beginning of the talk, I said that plasmas could be very, very fast. And this plasma, nanoplasma, is extremely fast because, as you can see, this is the dynamics of the development of nanoplasmas, uh, which it takes over in just a, a couple of hundred of femtosecond range. Femtosecond range, how the you know, plasma uh, evolves over such very short periods of time, and uh, which is much faster than the formation of, uh, for example, microplasmas that we generate using atmospheric pressure plasma jets and other uh, systems that uh, we have uh, at atmospheric pressure conditions. So consequently, we can uh, say that nanoplasma has a prominent place prominent place in their uh, density to energy diagram. Energy diagram and uh, under most extreme conditions, it could belong even to ultra high energy density area where the equivalent pressures generated by such nanoplasmas could go up to like 1 billion of atmospheric pressures. So it is a truly unique state of matter and uh, uh, has a very important fundamental uh, aspects to continue studying and also develop some interesting applications in the future. This is the last slide of my talk. Uh, in summary, that plasma nanoscience was developed and has emerged as an interesting and uh, still developing cross-disciplinary research area where we keep finding more and more new interesting uh, processes the processes that are plasma specific, many of them do not exist if we do not use plasma or ions. And as a result of these processes and interactions of plasma with materials, many unique properties and features of the materials appear, such as structure, such as uh, atomic bonds arrangements and uh, other morphological, structural, physical or chemical features and properties. As I said, those conditions very often are when other thermal, chemical, and other processes often fail. And uh, that leads to the diverse applications in energy, water, environment, health, and other areas. So these processes could contribute to the uh, sustainability agenda, to the development of uh, ultimately zero carbon emissions world. And finally, nanoplasmas is uh, one such ultimate high ultra high energy density frontier that deserves 
important considerations and careful studies in the near future. On this note, I thank everyone for their attention and uh, would like to thank everyone for uh, the interest in my talk. Thank you very much.